and we share a screen. So real quick as a disclaimer, um, we have no specific affiliations with any sort of organizations. We are here as students to learn. This is just helping us prep for our upcoming certification exam. And the material that we use on here is based out of the Springer Publishing Handbook, but we are not promoting this book as specifically. We are simply doing it uh, just to learn and become more uh, stronger professionals in our career field of being rehabilitation counselors. Uh, does everybody see me sharing my screen? Okay. You know what, if anything, Raquel, you should study. You can do that too, but I would encourage you to start it now. So you start getting material underway, at least refresh, because once we finish these next half, you can just figure out into the beginning part. So by the time you get ready for the July exam, you'll have most of the knowledge ready. So think of this like a cycled, uh, a continuous cycled group. So, um, but I would recommend definitely being a part of this, work with us, even though it's not July, do it now. So like that, you have enough material, enough things to study and prep for, and then come July time, you'll be feeling pretty confident. Okay. And with that, I'll just add new people on the way. So real quick, everybody can see my PowerPoint presentation. Hello? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's make this bigger. Okay. So the next area we're going to be touching is two sessions. So uh, both Raja and myself are going to be doing a presentation. Mine is about assessments. So this is just general terms about assessments, stuff that most of you as counselors should already know, or if you went to school, might have known it. It might be a great refresher, um, but you might sit in, in the exam. Uh, with that, I'm not going to spend too long on these things, but what I did do this time is set these up as a question that you may see in a, in a CRC exam and just get simple straight to the point. So if you've been working case management field, counseling, uh, human services field, or in anything you do, before you dab into anything with an individual, you always want to do what? An intake assessment. So by definition, this is an assessment is a systemic method, a systematic method of obtaining information from tests and other sources to draw inferences about characteristics of people's objects or programs. Pardon the minor, uh, the minor little uh, <laughs> typo there. So if you've done stuff like workforce development, worked in the rehabilitation center, the counseling field and stuff like that, you know that if you want to get to know somebody, you have to do an assessment and you have to understand who the person is, what affects them and what you're going to be the best way to help them. So that's the main purpose of the assessment counseling is to figure out what they need, help them achieve their, achieve their goals and outcomes. And not only that, we have tools underneath our belt that we can use, which I'll briefly touch on that, but I strongly recommend you read the book in case there are certain tests and assessments that you're not aware of. Okay. So, one of the things that could potentially be asked in the, uh, hey, Robin, welcome. Uh, one Hi. of the things that, that could be mentioned about in the actual assessment are the five models, the five step model problem, five step problem solving model. <laughs> and in a nutshell, when anybody's doing any assessment, they're looking at the orientation, identification, generating of alternatives, understanding, you know, the client's needs and strengths are, making decision makings, which includes the collaboration with your client and verifications, where the goals met. So for instance, in my job, when I have a new client coming in who's eligible for my services, I do an intake assessment using the IPE or individual employment plan. And that's to see uh, who they are a little bit, what barriers and stuff are gonna stop them from achieving their goals. What are some ways we're going to work around the goals? What are they doing now to take care of themselves? And then see if there's anything else that they want to include. And then with that, as they go through the program, is the program working for them or is it not working for them? Okay. So think about it when, if you're in a vocational setting, how you would do an intake assessment. So during a rehabilitation assessment, that uses the it we use this for is to describe an individual and their functionings. So recommend goals and objectives for free rehabilitation services, evaluate responsiveness to interventions and determine eligibility services and or supports for functions. Tell me, 
Is there anybody in here who has never done any sort of an intake or an assessment before? And would like to know a little more. Nope. Not too sure if you're talking, Robin. I see your, your section there highlighted or not. Could just be me muted up and welcome back, Rose. Okay. Well, with that, then I'm sorry. You have no one was from a different perspective. Okay. So I guess I guess uh for, for Emily, she probably did it a little a bit differently than us, but the principle probably is more than likely the same. The as far as the terms of the assessment. It's just how it's applied to different settings. So uh, with that, though, when a rehabilitation counselor does their assessments, though, it's ultimately to see what can a person do, what are they capable of, and for the most part, um, what can we do to help them meet that goal? So now in vocational rehab counseling in general, most of the time rehabilitation counselors tend to provide their assessment through a holistic approach. However, in some industries like privatized insurance, disability claims, social securities, they may not necessarily provide a full holistic perspective. It may take one perspective out of the group in total. Um, I think, I'm not too sure we talked about it last section. Maybe, maybe I talk about it in here, but for instance, like social security, they take more of a disability uh, approach like okay well if you can't work and complete all together then you're fully disabled versus the VA they do partially disabled and so they're only looking at the things that you can't do to say it's like a medical problem like there's something wrong with you as a as in regular like state and local vocational rehab counseling we want to know what the person can do so you're looking at everything you're looking at the person's physical well-being intellectual emotional components of personality and the environmental influence because if, let's say, your person is a substance user with a dual diagnosis and they're still in the same area that has, that they're still living in the same area where those drugs are prevalent, it's going to affect that person. And it's also going to affect your assessment and what you're able to write interventions for. Anybody have, uh, want to comment or thoughts about like some of their previous work experience doing assessments? The reason why mine are different is because I was in a alternative school setting working with at risk students. So it wasn't so much of the original assessment as it was. I got to know them on a very personal level. So it was over a period of time in order to find what career uh, college um, vocation that they would be best suited for. So Assessments were a heck of a lot different than what, you know, the standard rehabilitation counselor does, because that's just like you don't know anything or anybody, you don't know anything about this person, as opposed to me knowing everything about the kids. Did I just go off in left field? No. Somehow? All right, no, because you, you, you sounds like you in your situation, it sounds to me like you build, you already have built a personal relationship when you used to work with your clients. So a lot of times, like in state beta agencies, you're not going to really know your client. That's why we need to do the yeah. assessment to get to know yeah. them. It's also a good way to uh, build a rapport, which I think we'll be discussed about here momentarily. And I appreciate you sharing that because uh, especially, especially when you give like certain therapies and counseling, you do sometimes get to know a couple of your clients in a bit more of a personal interpersonal level. Yeah. Um, with that, um, let me ask you, Mrs. Raquel Castillo, uh, have you ever given an assessment before in your field of work? Me? Um, Raquel Castillo. Oh, right. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yes, I have actually. Um, I used to work for um, an agency that works with um, high school students. So we would go into the school and um, do any kind of assessment I thought was appropriate, depending on the level of um, um, the, the student's disability. So um, I guess it's more um, 
uh, not adult assessment. Oh, I don't know what kind of assessment you're um, referenced to or if it's in general. It, just in general. So you've done assessments for youth, very yes. similar to, to Emily in here. So, and of course mm -hmm. those things take a little bit more uh, tools to approach that versus somebody who's an adult. So Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Definitely. So I appreciate there are a lot share. more rules too than it with adults when you're working with students. It's a lot of red tape you have to go through. Right, Raquel? Uh yeah. Actually, my co-worker at that agency was focusing only on because we were getting the referrals from Access VR. So she was working mainly with 21 and up. I was working yeah. from 21 and under. So all high school um, students. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, um, I never got to do um, any assessments or any uh, administer any assessments on adults, but the ones that I could use um, on youth, she also used on adults, but I never got to do one, like I never got to administer um, an assessment on an adult. Definitely, and I'm sure there's there's not big differences. It's just the, what kind of tools and stuff that you use, which by the way, I'm going to write a quick little scenario and then I'm going to touch on the next slide here to see based on some of your experts here, because we have experts in this room, what were some of the assessment tools that you use? So let me just write this quick scenario quick and then we can have a brief discussion. Um, I'm going to run this earlier, but it's a little late, so I'm almost done. That's a kind of interest. Okay, so I'll give you some time to read that. Very brief, but it should pretty much touch on here because we're going to talk about some of these things. Um, when we do an assessment on an individual, we want to select the right type of test for the client's evaluations, which tests and procedures are going to determine the most appropriate assessment, how the test is going to be administered, and then interpreting, communicating findings in a written report. So with that being mentioned, going back Earlier in the lectures, we talked about evidence-based practices. This is in reference to like an evidence-based practice where if we're going to do, if we're going to provide an intervention or do an assessment, we want to find something that's reliable and maybe valid. So thinking about your own experiences and your own department there in that scenario, and I'll go ahead and I'll just copy and try to paste it up here and hopefully everybody can see it. Um, Let's see. I'm going to make this into a little bit into a question. And it's okay if I don't get it right yet because we'll talk about some of those tests here in a little while. But tell me, uh, you just met Janice. She's a 15 year old student at a high school and she was seen by the school counselor because she was, she was socially awkward and doing some weird behaviors. Upon further evaluation, she was diagnosed with uh, autism on maybe a, a severe spectrum, just for some reason it just developed. So with that, uh, let's say, and, and you're not too sure if this child's gonna wanna pursue a higher education or not. 
let's say they're, they're getting ready to graduate soon. It may have been a few years. Uh, what kind of test would you want to give for that client? What kind of test or assessment would you want to do to determine the, the, the student's abilities? I have a question. Sure. Don't most um, businesses or institutions have a test that they call their go-to test? They find that is the one that you use more than other tests rather than you giving the choosing what test to give actually that's a good question for the group here what do you all think because we're all across the united states so i would like to hear from the rest of the group in here their input on that i think the district has their own like emily is saying they have their own to go um, assessment tool to approach the situation. And sometimes even if you um, talk about or um, recommend one assessment to use, if it, it, it goes through um, a, um, a procedure, I wanna say, uh -huh. for the district to approve it. Yep. And it takes a long time or because they don't have it, they have to buy it if approved by the district. Yep. So it's going to take a while for, you know, the student to actually be assessed. So sometimes they end up being referred outside um, to their own provider to yep. get testing done. And then time goes by. And so the kid never gets tested if, an, um, you know, another assessment is more appropriate. Now, that's what I found that the, each district, you're correct, uh, has its... Um, testing and then a lot of the times parents go and have it done privately mm -hmm. and that's you know it's it's not as simple as they make it sound it's not like we have the authority or the mm -hmm. um, i don't know i can't find the word the, the freedom yeah. to choose well, a test right right and, and i mean you mm -hmm. and, I mean, you, you're both are making valid points. They're like, okay, it's district based, but let's put it in very basic terms. Like most real education counselors though. Rose, I think brought a good question up. What is the areas of restraint? So my question with Rose would be then, what tests would you use to measure her areas of strength? Um, I think, I don't know if I have a direct answer, but it does think that you can observe like, Maybe the things that she liked to do, like what things is she interested with to do? Mm -hmm. And then we can focus on those areas. Then we can build her from there to see how we can support her. Yeah, you know, and, that, and, and observation is definitely one of them too. That is a right. part of it. You know, uh, with that, somebody mentioned Holland Code. Okay, that's a yeah. potential. So as you see, when we go to these slides here and in the book, they do talk about specific tests. And no, you're right though. Like when it comes to schooling, I'm sure it goes by districts for certain assessments. But then at the same time, as a rehabilitation counselor, um, if we're working, let's say in a state vocational rehab agency, and let's say these are youth that are coming to our programs, then... Um, because they they can receive you can receive services through state VR services, for instance. Um, we also need to know what other tools and, and and what other tools and assessments are underneath our belts. So you're right, and but I also want you to think about you know what are some things you can use. What are some stuff on those assessments? Why are those tools even? Why do we want to use the Holland Code versus something else? So and we'll talk about that here shortly. But I really appreciate everybody's input. You know. Uh, my next move website and stuff like that. So those are going to be, those are some definitely some good ideas. So in terms of finding this youth, getting them job ready and stuff like that, definitely the way to be thinking about. So appreciate it. So with that, um, like, as you mentioned, some of you mentioned, you know, you're doing the observations. What is the person coming there for their service for? Why are they being referred? Is it mandatory from the school, like in that scenario? Is it because their parents are tired of staying with the kid and they want them to do something? Uh, what's the reason for coming there? Uh, what is the information and role 
of the function of the agency. Of course, you know, like for example, uh, Emily, she talks about a professional as a uh, mindfulness trainer or mindfulness counselor. And of course she would need to, if she's in a professional setting, she needs to talk about her credentials. You know, I need to talk about my credentials. Am I CRC certified? How many years have I been working? What is the agency designed to do? Because sometimes people get referred somewhere and they're like, I don't know what you guys do. Happens to me in my job all the time, all the time. Uh, with that, you're building an adequate rapport. You know, you want to know about the client. If that's your, if, if you're the one that referred into those services, those are those kind of things. Initiate the diagnostic process. That's where we start using those tools that are being mentioned in the group chat. And then inform the client of any medical, vocational, psych evaluations that must be completed. If you got a client who's dealing with severe depression and it's affecting them from doing their job and doing their hygiene, then chances are they might not be able to work at the moment. You know, so that, those are some of the things that in, in a general aspect, in most counselors, we do that without thinking about it. But when you take a step back, that's what we're ultimately doing. And you're all everybody's comments and input. It's pretty much hitting it on the spot here. So with that, when it comes to the assessment, there's different types of assessments. There's the medical evaluation. And this is one that requires a medical examination to determine the sense of one chronic illnesses or disability. This goes back to social security disabilities, insurance, uh, disability claims. With that too, it establishes if whether or not somebody has a disability. So going back to that child that the school counselor, we'll say Raquel, who is the school counselor, just throwing a name out there, we referred a child to, and she got an overall psychological evaluation, and they say, you know what, she does have symptoms that are closely related to autism disorder. She's able to do X, Y, and Z. She's not able to do X, Y, and Z at the moment. Um, with that, if it's a physical disability, what activities preclude the disability, or what was she able to do before she was disabled, and any type of further medical evaluation needed? Okay. Similarly, other evaluations we look at too, which, you know, we were talking about intelligence tests, which are great, the My Next Move, maybe you've heard of the ONET Ability Profiler. Those are what we look at as far as like, you know, I, kind of, I want to say functional assessments, those are ability assessments. So I, let me backtrace my steps. In social security disability, like I mentioned, they use functional assessment and functional capacities evaluations. So if you ever see anything that says, it says which services use FCEs, well, we know social securities and work-related injury claims. And in psyche evaluations, that also includes psychological and psychiatric, both. And then there's the other one, just what I'm referring to here, we do the vocational evaluation. That's the intelligence test, the next move, and ability profiler. And that's where you as a rehab counselor are observing a client's potential based on intelligence, knowledge, physiological functioning, what they're able to do. So my next question to you is this, why, let me just make sure I'm asking this question, make sure I'm saying this question correctly. Um, how do we know that these tests that some people are mentioned on here are good tests or good set tools to use for an assessment. How do we know this? I'd say because they're evidence-based maybe. Statistics. Right, they're evidence-backed and they're statistical. And that meaning that they have statistical significance showing that these are very valid and reliable tests. So speaking of that, that's where we go over here as far as us at least understanding the basics or reminders of why we use those measurements because they may use nominal scales, ordinary scales, intervals, or ratios, which please read that. If you're not remember those terms, read it. Um, interval scales, those are true zeros is like SATs, GRE scores. Um, numeric values, pardon the typo. No phone, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> My Google kicked on. <laughs> Um, and so forth. But you understand that when we use these tests, if they're statistically significant, they have to be measured on a scale, case in point. Um, with that, did I jump? 
this I think is a slide that's supposed to be able lecture, but you know what I can add in here. So understanding those seven types of tests that we use, when we do those career development theories, individual lives with a disability, um, I think this is an old slide. Let me get rid of that, sorry. There we go. Going back to here, that's why we talk about things as far as reliability and validity. Now, who here frequently, like myself, confuses the terms reliability and validity? I cannot do statistics. So no matter how hard I try, I will never remember them. The one class that I just could not get the statistics. So to me, re reliability and the little bit are the same thing. Okay. So I, and I agree with you, I suffer with that as well. And I kind of wrote this in a very simple mean point, and I would encourage you to read the bottom here. Reliability is, does the test have a consistent measurement for what it's intended to measure? And validity, you see how I already got that backwards? <laughs> validity refers to whether the test measured what it claims to do, but reliability is how consistent can a test become, how can a test result to be? So if, for instance, if somebody's talking about using an intelligence test, is the intelligence test or the IQ test high in validity and high in reliability? And if everybody was to take an intelligence test, we would show an even or a bell curve distribution and score within some average means or which average centered gender tendencies. So with that, the key here is the more reliable the test is, the higher the validity. The higher the validity, validity of the test is does not mean it's highly reliable. So when we use our those assessments that the district uses, we're hoping that they're using a test that measures good validity and good reliability to give you the assessment and the results. Because if they're giving you something that doesn't really measure what it's intended to do and it's not a really good test, why are you using it? Just because the school says so? Now you get now you're misdiagnosing all these kids, right? So those are things to think about. So like GAD7, PHQ9s, stuff like that. Those are tests that for the most part measure pretty high in reliability and validity. So if you get confused, read this slide. I try to make this as simple as possible. And I think there's also, I can send a video later too. There's also some videos for that. So with that, another thing you might see, you might potentially see on the test, may talk about who Carl Frederick Goss and Abraham DeMar is and what are they famous for? Who here has heard of the Gaussian curve? Oh, hold on. Okay, a test that will, that's a good question, Andrew. I didn't see that till now. Next time, just come off the mic and, and talk to me because I'm just going to keep going and, and miss it. Um, what would example of a test that's high in validity but not high in reliability? So, for instance, um, you can have an assessment that's measuring, uh, let's see. High in validity, but not high in reliability. Um, those are tests that, for instance, I'll give you a good example. Uh, most master's students in psychology are doing research. And so to make their tests more valid and more reliable, they try to get a big number of participants. So like, for example, when you have a small focus study group, like maybe a group of 12 people, they may have a high validity of people sharing their responses to everything, but because you have such a small number, it may not necessarily be reliable because depending on if the questions are closed-ended, if the questions are not measuring something as specific and it's open-ended, that's gonna affect how reliable the test is. But now if for instance, the focus group is like 30 people and we give everybody the PHQ-9 depression scale from zero, which is not at all depressed, to 10 being most likely depressed, that's where you have a chance of being uh, potentially high in reliability that most average people, if they score in this area, are going to have X, Y, Z symptoms. Does that make sense, Andrew? It does. Thank you for 
for uh, using that example. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh -huh. I there's one that stands out in my mind is um, reliable and validity. It it and and that's when Piaget and Erickson all did their testing. They t they tested only one specific type of group and they were white children boys and so how valid could or reliable could those test results be when the the pool they're drawing from is so small they might be reliable and valid but only to such a small percentage of the population so now i'm understanding it thank you yeah and you know that's a good point too like in a multicultural aspect in a lot of research studies there's not enough um there's not enough validity i guess you can say as far as understanding various demographics applying those uh applying those tests or experimentations to you know so and that, and that's a factor you see that today that's why and like where i live at we got a lot more population of Hispanics. So we're not going to see as many whites or African Americans. And so our studies are going to look different for something else. But again, depending on what you're trying to measure, if a majority of the population are in or are, are more or less hitting about the same as what it's intended to measure and it's consistent, then you have a test that's high reliability and high validity. God, this brings me back to my advanced statistics years. <laughs> so took a course in advanced stats um, but but it's, it's good for you to understand so if you're using those tools in assessment you want to make sure you're using a good one for your client especially if they have a disability because not all tests are intended not one test fits all every individuals just like emily brought up but there are tests out there designed to, to target a special populations depending on that person's disability which we'll see here shortly so all righty so with that something i want you to remember who if you see anything in the test about Brett Carl Goss or Abraham DeMar, or if you hear anything about a bell-shaped curve, that's the Gaussian curve. They, these two are the creators of the statistics of the bell curve, which in every single research, every single test of statistics, you will find a Gaussian curve because it lets us know how far things are measured and stand out from the norms. And again, this helps us to know how evidence-based practices, assessment, and tests are used and how reliable they are in interpreting the data. So let's go back to school. You have raw scores, standard scores, and percentiles. Raw scores are just think about it like school grades. You have, you throughout the semester, you scored 50, 130, 50, 130. And then that's how much you got right from the totals or the percentage. The standard scores we'll talk about here in the next slide. And then how it's ranked, that's percentile. So if the person is a has a low IQ score, then they're sticking in the top 10% of people that have extremely low IQs or the top 5% of world population of the extremely high IQs. Okay. So with standard scores, you might see this in the test. You might not see it in the thing, but just remember a little something here. And I broke it down to make it as simple as possible. And I'm not going to get into too much. I got a video. Oh, somebody has a cheat sheet. So, oh, thank you so much, Sarah. And make sure everybody download that cheat sheet because that's going to really help you. <laughs> that's actually really good. Thank you. Um, with that, when these tests of swords and stuff assessments are done and you're administering it or getting your client sent to get those tests administered, Sometimes the results are going to be mentioned in terms of numbers, but then of course it's going to be written in more details. But so, but just remember that if you see anything about standard deviations or standard scores, just remember Z scores M0, standard deviations one, T scores 50, standard zero 10, IQ 115. And then I never I don't know what a standing standard nine score is, so do not ask me. SD2. Um I saw a practice question, not the one I sent out, but another practice test that I did that talked about this. So if you could just remember these here, and if they're asking you what the T score is and, and there's in a, in a question, just remember T M equals 50 SD 10. Now you have to kind of memorize it. If you want to know more about that, uh, I'm going to give you the video here real quick about the uh, central tendency. Okay. I hope we can hope everybody can hear it. As I'm sharing screen, let me stop sharing real quick. Hold on.
stop sharing. I'm going to share it again, just making sure that I have sound on and I'm going to mute myself. So this can kind of help you in a nutshell, understand some statistics. Now, even though there are limits to what IQ tests can tell you, they're widely used and can be pretty useful, especially for educators. The popularity of IQ tests have been able to give us extensive knowledge of the range of IQ scores. Let's look at what IQ scores look like for the entire population. IQ scores are converted to have a mean of 100. Now, the standard variation around the mean is 15 points. This standard variation is called the standard deviation. This shows how much the score varies from the mean. So the mean would be zero because there's no difference. 15 points one way would be one standard deviation, two standard deviations, and three standard deviations. Same with the other way. One standard deviation from the mean, two standard deviations from the mean, and three standard deviations from the mean. 68% of the population is within one standard deviation from the mean. So 68% of the population has an IQ score between 85 and 115. Now 95% of the population is within two standard deviations from the mean. So 95% of the people you know score between 70 and 130 on an IQ test. And 99.7% of the population scores within three standard deviations of the mean. So between 55 and 145. Now, as you can see, with 99.7% of the population scoring within three standard deviations in either direction of the mean, that doesn't leave a lot of room for people to score above a 145. Or Raquel, can anybody else not see the video? No, it, no. it doesn't show the video. We see uh, your yeah, email no. here. Is your oh, Gmail man. that is showing on the screen? Shut the or front below door. Let me a 55. That real quick. Sorry about that. I must have hit the wrong button. <laughs> showing my GM, oh my gosh. All right, uh, let me reset the video again. I'm sorry about that. Next time, make sure, make sure, please tell me. I won't know until last minute. So I'm gonna start it again. It's only two minutes long. No worries. Now there are limits to what IQ tests now? can tell you. They're widely yes. used. Thank oh, you. Right. Pretty useful, no especially for educators. The popularity of IQ tests have been able to give us extensive knowledge of the range of IQ scores. Let's look at what IQ scores look like for the entire population. IQ scores are converted to have a mean of 100. Now the standard variation around the mean is 15 points. This standard variation is called the standard deviation. This shows how much the score varies from the mean. So the mean would be zero because there's no difference. 15 points one way would be one standard deviation two standard deviations, and three standard deviations. Same with the other way, one standard deviation from the mean, two standard deviations from the mean, and three standard deviations from the mean. 68% of the population is within one standard deviation from the mean. So 68% of the population has an IQ score between 85 and 115. Now 95% of the population is within two standard deviations from the mean. So 95% of the people you know score between 70 and 130 on an IQ test. And 99.7% of the population scores within three standard deviations of the mean. So between 55 and 145. Now, as you can see, with 99.7% of the population scoring within three standard deviations in either direction of the mean, that doesn't leave a lot of room for people to score above a 145 or below a 55. It's only about 15 out of a thousand people score higher or lower than either one of these two extremes. We also did an example like this in lesson two, the research methods lesson. You should go back and check it out. Now I share that with you because going back to here, Depending on what's being tested on, Z scores are standard, T scores are specific, IQ scores are big in numbers. And then don't ask me about standing because I still do not know. But the ultimate goal is in the Gaussian curve, that bell shaped curve on your population, the bigger your population is on a study, the more 
central tendency there is in the curve, which we'll talk about that here momentarily. But what's why is that important to you as a counselor? It's when you're using an assessment, you want an assessment that's able to measure the right audience for its right intended purposes and for the right population that has proven statistical and uh, statistical, scientific, and meaningful data. So that video is in now, there. Even though they're... I want to skip it. Any questions about that? Okay. So I'll take the sign that has a no. So when you're doing interpretations, like especially when you do the assessment, um, I know for my agency, we have another department that does the interpretations, but also I need to know, can the person, like, for example, when we do the test of adult basic education or TABE, I need to know if the person's able to learn above an eighth grade level. Do they have a competency above an eighth grade level to get a GED done and maybe to go into a specific uh, certification or training? If not, we need to get them studied and caught up because if they don't good necessarily do good in that assessment, they may not do good during their academics. So we want to help address that. So then you have baseline to current. So you, like, you know, you can do stuff like, for example, uh, going back to depression, you have a baseline assessment of what they score in a profession on the depression when they first met you. Every few weeks or a couple of months, you do another assessment and then you measure that. You have criteria references. Did you meet the, did, I wrote that there intentionally. Did you score enough, high enough to meet the requirements of CRC? Did you make the cutoff? Then you have norm references. And this is actually words per minute. I don't know why I put PSM, but um, because of her scoring, they put her in the percentile. So that goes back to the IQ level. Well, you usually score in a, um, in a uh, X percentile, either extremely too high of intelligence or extremely low of intelligence. Indicating a very high level of general ability to the whole number of group, but a standing one indicating very low relative achievement. So it sounds like achievement scores. I sound like that came from a book. <laughs> a standing is a score from one to nine. Uh, with a nine indicating very high level. So this sounds like it sounds like a scale. Thank you. And thank you so much. So now in vocation to rehab, uh, the book itself gives you way more assessments, which for the most part, uh, these are the ones I believe are the most common or at least that are taught in school, to my knowledge, or what was taught to me. But these are the ones that most commonly are used very frequently. So like ONET Ability Profile, which if you none of you ladies and gentlemen know about ONET, please visit ONET online. It has everything you need to know. And it'll make your job that much easier when you're doing career counseling or evaluations, especially if somebody needs to change their job occupation. It's really helpful. So use it. ONET Ability Profile or General Aptitude, a test battery, Armed Service Educational Aptitude Batteries, um, is this really intelligence? Yeah. Okay. No. I think I have two. Okay. I see what I did here. This is intelligence. And then this here is aptitudes. So. I'm going to point this question to Andrew, <laughs> just because he's prior service. Um, well, he was in the service. Andrew, do you know the difference between aptitude tests versus intelligence tests? Yes, the aptitude tests uh, help determine what you uh, can learn. Uh, well, you have the potential to learn, if I if I am not mistaken, where the intelligence test determines your overall intelligence. I see. You're right. When it comes to aptitudes, is what can the person do? So, if you want, to, and let's say going back to fifth to fifteen year old student, and she wants to go into a specific career field despite her limitations, it might be helpful to maybe do a known that ability profile. Maybe she doesn't know what she wants to do. I mean, do most 15 year olds know what they want to do when they grow up? I thought I wanted to be in the Air Force. I ended up joining the Army, <laughs> you know? So there's other ones too. Like with the military, if anybody's going into the military, they have to take an ASVAB. 
and that's just the ability to see what they're capable of doing. That's why you can have some very smart people score terrible on the ASVAB and not the most smart people score excellent on the ASVAB. Uh, and you have stuff that's through like career ability placement surveys and career scopes. Another one. Uh, now, this one, going back to the challenges, is based on what the person's capable of learning or um, capable of comprehending. So it looks at their intellect. So, for example, if your client is blind, you don't want to maybe give them a, a, an ability test. You might want to give them the haptic intelligence test to kind of see where they're at as far as what they can and cannot do. Nonverbal intelligence, the Tony Ford, to say that, that 15 year old is quiet. And the application in the OAS or the Occupational Aptitude Survey, which I think is it's mixed between intelligence and aptitude. But if you go back to the book, it's in there. Okay. Now, the book talks a lot. All right, take care, Raquel. The book talks a lot about this one, the wise four. So please read that. Please read that on your own. They, have, they go into very details with it. I guess that's like the, the golden standard for disability assessments, intelligence assessments. And then, of course, you got your uh, achievement tests. Adult basic learning examinations. That's other, like the tape, test of adult basic educations. The Westchester Individual Achievement Test, Y at four and the wide range of achievement tests. So these are different ones that they have there. Last but not least, you also have the personality ones as well. The Beck BD inventory, Meyer Briggs type indicator and so forth. So in your roles, when you do the assessments, you have a lot of tools available to you, but as long as you know what your audience is, that's what you can use to run your assessments. So with that moving forward, I'm gonna let Raja go ahead and take the rest of the remaining lecture from here because the stuff that we do in assessment is very related to our career and job placement. So thank you for your time. I'll let you go ahead. Do you need me to share a screen for you, Raja? Yeah, I can see it. I can see it like how you have it right now. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm gonna cover the career development and job placement chapter. So I kind of just covered a little bit of it um, because a lot of it was kind of <clears throat> mentioned in the assessment chapter and everything is in detail. So please take the time to look at each one of the tests. Um, so I didn't really cover that in this uh, you know, presentation. So starting off is like, what is the purpose of career development theories um, in an individual's life with disability? So basically as a rehab counselor, we are helping them to explore their vocational goals. And every individual can come with a disability or even you know, a mental health. So we wanna make sure that we become like an advocate and help them with the journey to identify those kind of goals and help them find careers that are <clears throat> consistent with their interests and abilities. And based on their interests and abilities, this is where the testing comes from, the assessments come from to see where an individual is in their life, especially when they have, for example, been unemployed for a very long period of time. And <clears throat> these theories address occupational choice, work adjustment, progression of career-related goals and behaviors. So who was Parsons and what was his contribution? He was basically in 1909, founder of the career development movement. He developed the trade and factor theory in which trait is the characteristic of a person, basically your personality, skills, who you are, and the factor aspect was, uh, is the environmental characteristic. So based on, I would say like, if my client is organized, she likes to um, you know, keep things in order, then maybe as a start off, it would, she would benefit from being in a clerical position and office position. So that's what the factor part is and the, the environmental characteristic is. Um, and that's what he means by P times E. Where, what were his career development stages? Self-understanding and awareness of work requirements and conditions, reasoning on the interaction of self-knowledge and vocational information. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the P and E, um, I believe, comes from Alfred Adler's Ad Adlerian theory. Uh, if I can remember right, he was it was that theory that emphasized the person and the environment uh, uh, make up the person, where it was 
Freud who said he was very person focused. Um, I can't remember if it was Alfred Adler, but I'm pretty sure it was. Anyone know for sure? Yeah, you're right about the person and the environment, like how you explained it. Um, and I think um, that's how Parsons carried out it into like a career development movement because they do kind of go hand in hand. That's neat. Thank you. Just real quick, think about 1909 and when Freud and Adler were doing their theories. You can kind of date that. You can kind of date that when, when these things make sense because it's not to mention this is around the same time like you said Freud was coming out, Adler and everybody else. All the other theories are coming out. So there are some people that really predate others that took from another person too. So, I mean, it makes sense that they would share some of those principles together too. It's something to think about. So he basically, and that's correct, um, it was that time period. And so Parsons basically said that it's, you know, imperative, you know, our goal as a rehab counselor for the career selection process to include an evaluation of the client's understanding. So basically do, do an evaluation, assessment, intake, interview them, and use various instruments, which are basically the different kinds of tests. Um, and what he meant uh, about the traits and factors, he talked about it's to evaluate the five basic traits and factors, which are their values, personality, interest, their aptitudes and achievement. And <clears throat> like I said before, it can be used for a client who's been out of work, um, say due to substance use. I mean, I'm my, you know, I studied mental health, so I um, use that kind of, use that example. The next slide. So. I just kind of jumped into the Minnesota theory of work adjustment. It is a type of work adjustment theory. It was, you know, in the 1960s, um, it was developed to improve job placement outcomes of VR clients. And it was like the first career development theory, specifically for people with disabilities, uh, focusing on job, job satisfaction, satisfactoriness, and job tenure. And even the Minnesota theory just you, uh, focuses on assessments of abilities, values, personality. It measures the abilities and values that are needed for occupations to basically for the rehab counselor to get to work with you of who you are as a person. Um, and the main objective was to help a person with a disability find gainful employment, uh, to not set them up for a failure and find something that they would be able to, you know, the goal was to sustain employment. So I guess one of the tests that was used was the Minnesota Importance Questionnaire to assess how much an occupation reinforces the value patterns of individuals. Um, so I like to work in a busy environment. So a job that fostered this value system would reinforce similar personal values. So I don't know, I guess I could use an example of a mechanic who is always surrounded in a busy environment. And basically their personal values and abilities is why they would you know, choose an environment like that, if that makes sense. Um, so Holland, theory of vocational choice, he's definitely very popular um, you know, in, in when it comes to career development. Um, an individual's vocational choice is based on personality type. And that's where the RISEC six different categories of occupations and personality type comes from. He developed that. And he believed that a person's beliefs, the worldviews, generalizations, and stereotypes are usually accurate. And he basically wanted to investigate these beliefs and stereotypes. Uh, Holland assigned both people and work environments to specific work personality types. And that's why that's how the RISEC uh, category comes from. And I just broke it down, uh, you know, what each of them means. So anybody who's a realist enjoys working with machines, investigative analysis, problem solving, you know, it can be a police officer, a BI agent, um, artistic, enjoys creative activities that uh, supports individual expression, creativity, music, um, social, enjoy helping others. It also includes, you know, counselors, um, psychologist, social worker, enterprising, 
is somebody who might enjoy activities that are persuasive, mostly in the business world or even human resources, um, management occupations, conventional, who enjoys well-defined organized tasks, working in an office setting to allow record keeping and data management. Has anybody ever tried to use um, this type of test with their clients or have heard of it before? Um, yes, this is Ama I have. Hi. Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so I've used the strong to, to give to, um, to students um, before and have uh, certified and recently uh, certified in the strong. Um, yeah. I don't know. You want me to say something? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're free to share, um, you know, as you like, because um, I've heard of Holland before, too. And uh, I remember just taking like a free test um, in one of my classes. So it was pretty interesting to find out the category. Um, yeah, the, the test is actually the actual test is 291 questions. Wow. Yeah. And, um, the six, right, the six themes are um, you get a you can get a, a like a combination of over 700 to 720 arrangements and the what they focus on the four things is who you are what you do how you do it and where you do it so those are the four things that they um you know focus on and it's looked at different ways so when they do the combination they think your your top three and your your top three letters. So our, say for example, let's, let's just say this was the order that somebody chose with the RIASEC model. So the first one would be who you are, which means the person is fundamentally a realistic person. And then what is their approach? What do they really wanna do? They would want to do um, investigative things that they would be, uh, so be a realistic person who is um, investigative, they love, um, things that are analytical, scientific, solving problems. And then who you are, what you do, how you do it, how you do it be the approach would be like through an artistic means. That person may be um, very creative in how they do it. And then the environment where you want to do it is in a social. So a person who would be Realistic, they even like realistic people also like to use their hand, use their bodies. They could be in, in a physical fitness. They could be a gardener. And let's just say this person is a realistic person and um, they want to, if I was to choose, um, let's see, solving problems, intellect, say if they um, like to research and they want to research buildings. So that person might even be an architect. They do it in a creative way that they design buildings in a um, creative way to solve a particular problem in an environment. Maybe they do Habitat for Humanity. Maybe they're the engineer who puts things together. So that's kind of how you could, um, a person will look at it. And there's other things. This goes deeper than that, but that's just like a basic. Yeah, it is pretty interesting. And thank you so much, Ama, for um explaining that uh because it it can go in many different type of way um when you do the test it's i think it takes about an hour or so or maybe a little bit more but i really appreciate your input yeah it's standard takes about 40 45 minutes they have versions for uh, modified versions for high school students for um college college students seekers and then adults it's basically the same questions but it's the maybe um, how they actually code them. And so those four areas that I also mentioned, who you are, what you do, how you do, where you do it, these um, is I actually categorized in, um, uh, wow, in different areas. Mm -hmm. You're gonna look at the, they'll, they'll do a whole assessment around um, what type of work environment do you wanna work in? They'll classify you in your top 10 um, industries and they rank them. Um, so say if somebody is social, let me look at this. If somebody was, there, so let's say their top one was realistic and then investigative, but within realistic, they'll have maybe 10 different occupations in both. 
and let's just say investigative, maybe that person, maybe mathematics will be number one. They, they have a value associated with it. Um, that value is going to be determined. Other thing that's important about the, the strong is that they look at it from two levels. They're going to assess you. You're assessed based upon gender because you're male or female response based upon, you know, from the 1920s when they started this that's the reliability that they base it off of. Then they also assess you generally between the total population. So you may have some slight variation even within the various um, personality, I mean, combination. So that's, I'm gonna stop. I know you don't wanna talk about that a lot, but- Oh yeah. no, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That was definitely uh, very detailed and I appreciate um, you know, your input. Sarah, did you wanna say something? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I could hear you. Okay. So oh, the um the okay, so in class I had to take the self-directed search, which is the expansion of the Holland Code, which you have to pay money for, but not everyone has money to pay for that test. So the ONAT is the one that you take the Holland Code with. And I have to do that for my career expiration clients that Honestly, they love it. They love to figure out what they are so they can figure out the jobs that connect it to the DOT, which is like the Department of Labor, I think it is in New York State. So then it correlates back and forth, mm. if that makes sense. How was your experience like working with clients when they were able to at least have an idea of where to start? Oh, it's amazing for them. Like to see like for them to understand that their work occupation matches their code like it gives them like another type of confidence boots. Like, oh my goodness, like I can do this. Like yeah. there's actually jobs that like relate to what I want to do and not what I'm being forced into doing. Cause a lot of the time, like my clients are being forced by their parents to come and they don't want to come. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, it, and it, it's good to know that how many options you can have um, and which career to focus on or see based on your personality type and I think it's, it's a very interesting test to take. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. So the next slide. So Holland's hexagonal model of career fields. I, I just, you know, um, try to replicate the, the hexagon model that was in the chapter. It was figure 808.1 8 in page 209. So we can go on to the next slide. Good job, by the way. That's Wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm I tried. I'm like, I need to, you know, I don't want to show it like in short. So yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. I appreciate it. Uh, there's some other ones too, but then this is really good. Like, kudos to you. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Thank you. Okay. So the income frame of career development. Um it was developed by beverage beverage um to conceptualize the career development of people with disabilities and expanded by Hutchinson. And Beveridge, Beveridge was 2002, Hutchinson, Herchins, I'm so sorry, is 2010. Um, so basically for people with disabilities, um, imagine, Damn. sorry, one second. So I am imagining persons with disabilities aware that they are occupations in the world of work and jobs that may be a good match for them, informing them about having a clear understanding of one's abilities. So that's what a rehab counselor would be working on. Um, it's just a framework, you know, um, good knowledge of pros and cons, opportunities and prospects and different lines of work, choosing when a job seeker has internalized career knowledge about the self and work and then selects a job or educational program. Obtaining it, people seek and obtain a job or occupation of their choice or closely related one. Maintaining it, adapt to the job and sustain it. It involves a dynamic interaction between the person and the environment. And exiting is the process of thinking about leaving or actually leaving present job. So this is like the income framework of career um, development. Uh... So basically, like I said, you know, people with disabilities become aware that there are occupations 
it kind of, you know, helps them understand about their abilities and choosing jobs, sustaining it. It's like, I hope I'm explaining it correctly. It's like um, a step-by-step -step process on how, you know, you can be aware about yourself as a person, um, get to know about what interests you um, and what prospects would uh, what pros prospect would you be interested in in terms of uh, you know employment or okay, occupations so this is one of some of the this is a, like a framework that some counselors may use with their clients next slide social learning theory explained how people develop career interests set goals and how determined they are in achieving those goals it's kind of like an extension of the Bandura social cognitive theory. Um, I wasn't able to get much detail from the chapter, but does anybody know about this theory? Bandura social cognitive theory, because it was adapted from him. To be honest, I no. do not, but I'm guessing when in the assessment, I guess when you do the assessment of that kind of thing, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of helping a person really think about the career that they want to get into. That's the only thing I can understand. So, yeah, and I noticed like uh, the, the different kinds of theories and- um, oh, Sarah raised her hand too, by the way. What was that? Oh. Um, okay, so I have a quick example. I use this in my probation with, um, getting them to think for a different change. So it's called thinking for a change. Mm -hmm. And basically we give them a different thought process. So instead of reacting like an iceberg with the top of it, we show them that you can go through your thoughts with your beliefs and your feelings and then give the other person validation before you react right away. It's mm -hmm. changing their mindset. And the same thing with um, this one, this is where it comes from. So they can get to a better mindset so they can get employment so they can stay and change their pathway. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So Super's lifespan theories, Donald E. Super is most recognized for his contributions. Um, uh, to the vocational guidance movement and later to the counseling psychology, which basically, you know, includes career counseling and life planning. He was also a well-known psychologist. So his model was, is based on the belief that self-concept changes over time and develops as a result of experience. So basically, you know, us as individuals, when we're infants to adulthood, uh, we go through different life stages that are age related and stages of growth, exploration, establishment, maintenance and decline or disengagement. So I just found like a short YouTube video for you all to see. Thank you, Kennedy.
created using Powtoon. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, any comments, one. anyone? Any any additions, comments? I thought it was the best way to kind of like shorten, explain it because I try to explain. And when I find something, I think it's just better to show. Can you share that in the chat? Yeah, sure. I got um, you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can we just take this uh, link? Um, Kenny and Roger just copy it in there when we're looking at this. What she has down here, just copy it and put it in our browser okay. to open it. Yes, yeah, so you can like just copy and you can copy and paste it to your browser. Okay. Yes, there it okay. is. It Thank really you. Good. Okay. Thank you. No, I appreciate the video. It's a good video, and I'm 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 commenting in the box, but I do think that our next era, which is probably it's already now, but even more soon, they're gonna need us in geriatrics a lot. You know. Yeah. For this. All right. So, job placement strategies and tools. Um. Placement, uh, job placement of people with disabilities at the highest level possible, that's the goal, has been central to the professional practice of rehab counseling. Quality job placement results from quality vocational assessment, planning, counseling in the early rehab phases. To facilitate vocational decision making, a rehabilitation client must be exposed systematically to the world of work. We help them, you know, to do that, develop insights for skills abilities, interests, and physical functioning. This is just like a summary of, you know, what we do as rehab counselors, what we should be focusing on when somebody's coming to us for looking for a career choice or even job placement. So it's just to be an advocate, a guide to help them and try to explore every aspect of themselves with their personality to best see which, um, uh, jobs they could be suitable for. Sometimes, you know, like super's life stages that was just spoken about at the age of 20, you know, somebody might think that they want to, you know, um, get into a business field. But sometimes when you're in college, you're exploring, you're like taking different classes, maybe change your major. But then um, later on, you might think, okay, maybe I want to do something else. So uh, it's a lot of work. Um, from the from the rehab counselors, uh, you know, as a job to help people. But I think the best way that we can help facilitate, because um, the goal is to, you know, help them achieve a positive outcome. Is your next slide? Oh, that was it. Yeah, so basically, like, you know, a career, a skilled rehab counselor has a responsibility to be knowledgeable about the theories Sometimes we might, we might not think to use all of the assessments and tests because it all depends on which group of population we're serving, uh, where we're working, but it's always good to keep in mind about your community resources, um, incorporating their medical and psychosocial um, aspect of disability, vocational impl implications of different disability conditions, uh, what could be some of the work demands, that clients can face, especially helping them to understand the reality of the world when they step out and actually go into their job site, um, offer them training opportunities in the local uh, you know, community, uh, one-stop centers, things like that, helping them uh, with their resume, uh, the availability of job accommodations, so finding out that if a person with a disability are going to be accommodated in any way, um, you know, using assistive devices to, you know, that should not be a, like a no, it should be allowed if uh, a person with disability needs to use one at their job. Um, and, you know, just giving them the resources to work through the process of being at a work site, especially you know, there's many challenges that somebody faces depending on their diagnosis. So somebody might just come and it would take them time. You offer them a job coach um, to check in or they might go to a day habilitation or career, a day habilitation that offers 
uh, a job coach to help them, you know, get started. There's many different ways that I just wanted to kind of say, you know, as a skilled counselor, what we should be focusing on and how to help them. Um, next slide. So I just, um, you know, listed all the internet resources that were mentioned in this chapter. One Stop, Career One Stop, ONET, very popular. Um, everybody uses that to figure, you know, see the different occupations. U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, Career Development, National Career Development Association, LiveCareer.com, and in the next two slides, just you know, have a list of all the resources that we can use um, to help a, a person with disability get into employment. I also had like uh, this free test. Can we go back to where it shows all the slides? Um, I think when I was talking about the Holland theory, um, yeah, on the bottom, the notes, I can't see the notes. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, so truity.com was where I kind of just wanted to, you know, have you guys take a test and see what you, what your result is. Collins Code Career Test. It's not that long, as you know, um, I mentioned about you know 291. So I just you know you just choose dislike, neutral like. And it gives you like a brief, you know, description and result based on these uh, I'm just going to see what happens. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, better is like steps to five and star. Well, some of these things I was thinking about, like with Holland also, like was it, would it be like a realist, uh, artistic, um, you know, um, which, which kind of personality would it come under? Um, but as I was answering these social, Done it, but don't care for it. That design magazine, that's kind of like the artistic personality type. <clears throat> I selected things that you really believe. <laughs> fire and fire employees, you changed it. You changed it from like to being in the middle. That's what makes it. <laughs> from like <laughs> and to like, being neutral. <laughs> it yeah. says on top dislike, neutral, like. I like I like doing this. It was fun. Yeah. The more <laughs> accurate, the more you stay away from neutral as you really believe it, the more accurate it'll be. I'll yeah. Imagine. I know. I mean, if you all want to see hire it, than fire somebody, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> interested in seeing what the strong actually looks like I can share I can show you my report if you're interested um you know and if I'm about to, I shouldn't say this but I'm gonna say it anyway if anybody would actually like to take the full strong um uh I can do it I mean I can I mean this is like I shouldn't think of this cost money it's like 20 I would like like 25 dollars or what have you just to take the test and I send you a link if you actually wanted the real thing. I mean, the full thing, if anybody wanted. But oh, I can still show you mine if anybody's interested. Sure. If you want to go ahead and share Sure. It. That'd be great. I'm almost done yeah. with this anyway. Okay. <laughs> so we can just you stop sharing here. I just want to get this for quick and then we'll share your part. So we're pretty much okay, yeah, like the car engine, take apart a car engine that's like mm -hmm. mechanical, under realistic, mm -hmm. people with mechanical athletic abilities. Yeah. Focus on phone. 
No needed family, help the needed family in front of proper housing. Yes, give a speech in front of many people. Sure, persuade others from my point of view. Yes, <laughs> strongly. <Yeah. laughs> Just kidding. Do I want to collect via tax cutter? Absolutely no. No. Okay, let's see what happens. You're creeping. Building thinking. <laughs> wow, I'm 100% on persuading. Shut the front door. My, my career has completely changed. Oh, that's enterprising. That, that's enterprising. So that's the, um, yeah. I'm not telling you the, the strong themes they're just, they're doing the, the key word associated. So persuading is associated with enterprising. Organizing is con associated with conventional. Uh, thinking is associated with um, investigative. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Basically, so that they kind of wrecked their own spy. So go for that. I'm, I'm gonna let you. Uh, I'm gonna make you. I, I think I, I set the share screen for multiple participants, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Let me find. I had opened it. Thank you. You know what? I'm. I thank you for letting me share. Cause I was like, I don't have anything to share in this meeting. I don't even think I should log on. Look at this. Okay. I just spent a few minutes to. Like what, three minutes? I don't want to take over. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. So I'll just bring out the key points in the um what they do, the strong. The top part right here will always show male or female um, in terms of doing it. They're making some changes. They're trying to, I'm not sure how they're gonna do it, make changes to account for the gender evolution that we're in now, but um it's based off right now, it's so based off of how people um, respond. Um, so you have, you have six, you have, in addition to the six letters, the six personalities, you have different ways that they're um, categorized. Um, general occupational themes, basic interest scales, occupational scales. I'm going to go a little bit more into this personal style scales and um, your profile summary. So just skim down. Um, this happens to, this is mine, I don't mind sharing. These are my, uh, my theme, investigative, social, artistic. You just look at the top three. My numbers actually were the same. Um, and because if you get enough, sometimes the scores are gonna show you that if the scores are the same, then you ask the individual client to determine which one is, um, resonates most with them. So then you get your code. So this is going to be your theme code. This, this code you'll also see on ONET when they're classifying jobs. But on ONET, they may use a different combination of the code for a particular um, job title. But this, the other thing about the strong is that the um, occupational outlook handbook, the knowledge, skills, and abilities, and the category, the categorization of all the jobs. Oh, I could turn, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have my phone, okay. Um, is my camera on now? I'm even on camera, I'm sorry, I thought it was on camera, okay. You're good, you're good. Okay, it's based off of the strong, or the Holland Code, I mean, did a strong interest inventory, then, you know, moving towards the strong. So it's, that's why this is so important. All job classifications in the United States is based off of the, the strong. So that's why it's very important. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. So within the score, they're gonna tell you, you get a, a standard score, not necessarily standard deviation, but just called a standard score and interest level. So within this, you'll see that this is very high. This means that of all women who responded similar to me, that my interest is investigative and social is very high. It's like, like a high correlation to the millions of people who have taken it since 1920, right? And then you also see here, the standard score, the general population is 70 because there could be some variation, right? And um, so this, like I said, this will tell you who you are, what you wanna do, how you want to do it, where you want to do it. I forget the other, there's other two, but these are, you know, primary. Um, so if you go down now, what they're going to tell you with the combination, the first things are um, when they're taking your individual code and then pulling out 
10 um, occupations that have been um, specifically based upon how you respond, they rank them. And from that, from that ranking, you get the basic interest scale, right? And this is almost like who you are, basically. Um, and so you're going to have your five interest areas. Health, for me, health, performing arts, sciences, medical, and social. So within that, this is your top. But then you can, you look, when you look here, you're going to identify how they determine this is they're going to look at the highest number that you chose. So my highest number within all of this is in healthcare services. Although it's not technically my first, my strongest one, it comes like second, but it's in healthcare services. So that's how they determine the ranking based upon your overall number with the total population. Am I, that makes sense? Yes. All right. This is very good for me because actually the ironic thing is that tomorrow morning I have to do this presentation to some uh, university. Thank you so much for explaining it like step by step. It's... Yeah. So, and they, they call these initials. Now, these are important. The business, they call the business, the BIS, they call it the, biz, the business. Um, then the next thing is your, the occupational um, scale. So that's like saying, who you are, what you want to do, that second one. <laughs> so this the occupational skill tells you exactly what you want to do. Now, these their variations, even though you have, if I'm advising somebody, you would say you see something that you're interested in. It doesn't mean that this is absolutely what you're supposed to do, but it's a close correlation. And so they have some things that I'm actually interested. I am actually interested in like a health person, like holistic health. So this it was interesting and kind of parallel with the, the qualifications, the skill set of a chiropractor. So you look at here what you what you're interested in, and then this is what you're not interested in. The benefit of this strong, because and I, I'm I'm not sure where it's going to take you. Do you still see the you still see the strong? Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes. If I click on it, I'm just going to where is it? If I click on it. It's going to then, I'm going to flip back. It's going to take me directly to ONET, mm, right? Yeah. So there again, Great. that's awesome. The significance of, of um, ONET, what he was talking about in the whole career thing, this is like um, foundational. So I would assume that even if we haven't taken the test, they will probably emphasize where that pertain to the strong. So it's just going to show you all of the knowledge, skills, abilities. And if I can scroll down, I'll show you the, um, let me see if they have this one on this one. The, the uh, same, the similar code. Let me see, I'm scrolling down. Uh, just keep going yeah, further down. Here on interest, SIR, this one is saying uh, social, investigative, and realistic. But like I said, they'll switch it up. So anyway, just let me, let me, I'm going to go back to the strong, but I just wanted to show you the relevancy and significance of this, why it's so important. Um, I'll take a few more minutes and I'll be done. All right. The other thing uh, with the occupational scale, see you get a ranking. There are more, but it's going to give at least, I think, I don't know if this is 20. And this so you can see what a person is least interested in. <laughs> just have somebody come, if, if I, if I tell you I want to be a mathematician, I'm trying to get a math job, and you look at this, you're going to have to find a nice way to tell me, I, I, I don't think you'll be very interested in that. <laughs> um, and so there's a, this range, is the, this would be considered very high because they have a mid-range. The mid-range is 40 and above, and some other places is 50 and above, but anything above 40 is matching. Anything below is a least, cor you know, likely correlation or interest. That's how you can tell. Um, and then, let me just scroll down. It's going to go through each one. So I'm, I'm going to get you to the main thing. Now, the pivot is the personality 
uh, style scale. So this is going to tell you the work environment where, you know, or the type of thing, the type of people, type of things that you are. So in a nutshell, um, this chart right here explains this, that a person prefers working with people. So that is your work style. You're over slightly 46 and above or definitely above 54 is a higher correlation, but they can go either way. Um, the learning environment, you prefer lectures and books. So you can see that. And then you also have the number, right? Leadership style is, what is it? <laughs> Probably prefer to lead by taking charge. I do, I really, anyway. So um, I'm gonna skip on that. But anyway, so it's going to tell you, do you, um, you may dislike taking risk, risk taker. So these are the components, work style, learning environment, leadership style, your ability to take risk. Um, and team orientation. So this is higher. So these are the other components. There's something else. Now here on your profile summary, so if you're working with someone, this kind of gives you an at a glance, a, a fact sheet, a cheat sheet or tip sheet, if you will. You're gonna see your code, your theme code. You tell everybody you need to know that, what it is, your skill, your interest areas, and what that corresponds to what the person is not interested in. Um, your strong, your top strongest occupations and your personality skill, right? Personality style. This one, I'm not very good on reading this, but it has something to do with, um, I'm not good at interpreting this part, except that it's, it, it calculates how many questions that you answered, like strongly like, like, et cetera, a dislike. And they want to make sure you answered all of them. And there's a um, this typical index. I don't know what this means, but this it's within range. It means this it matches. So um, that's basically. Let me see what else. If I can just. So then what they do is they will give you give a person different types of jobs for. Say me and you or Kennedy or we got the same. We're both investigative. You may have different majors in here than me because it's based upon how you answer the question. And so it gets very specific, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes um, even more specific as you can guide students in terms of healthcare, et cetera, with you know, different um, other occupations that they can look at. And it and yeah, let's see what is anything else I want to bring out. Uh, that's a highlight, it's a summary. Oh, this is really good stuff. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank really you so much. Stuff. This is and awesome. Then, definitely, if you have the link for us to do it, I'd like to do it my own self too, because it's been a minute, it's been years. <laughs> and I know my career <laughs> stuff has changed too, but thank you. Yeah, so it's thank something you. I, have, I would have to just charge the fee that it cost me to um, do the, the test. So it'll be basically like, I think it's $20. I think it's like $20. Yeah. So, but you know, they charge people lots of money because you got the, the thing you're paying for is interpretation. So like interpretation is usually about an hour. I will, you know, go in detail with is this am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Yes, yes. you are. Sorry. Okay. How do I unshare? Let me stop sharing. How do I unshare? That's fine. I can uh I think I, I should know how to do this, right? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you just said it takes a minute to get to look at it. But um with that though. Again, behind that whole strong assessment comes the statistic measures that give us those readings. Mm -hmm. So, and they're pretty accurate. So those are the things to think on that. With that though, I really appreciate the input tonight. I hope this time was more engaging and I do appreciate the contributions. So I'm gonna stop recording real quick, but this was really good. And um, 